So our guest host today is a man who does very many things. He is a broadcaster, who worked at KTN, was a news reader, worked at KTN, uh, anchored a show called The Summit, in which he interviewed. In fact, I think you were the first person to have a, to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the former president, Daniel Arap Moy. The only person. You must get it right. Uh, the only. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the only person to ever interview former president Daniel Arap Moy one-on-one. Well, uh, it, I mean, I'm Eric, insisting on the one-on-one -on -one because others yeah, could have said, you know, exactly. <laughs> but one, you must have a a measure of um, relativity. I mean, at the time, it was something that had to happen eventually. Mm. It's just a growth. I mean, now it's a given. Uh, our president, our deputy president, it was a big deal in 1997 but it isn't a big deal and that's the way it should be mm. not anymore not anymore but at the point it was it was and uh, who who got you the interview was it you was it the editors at the at the ktn that's the story in itself you have to wait for my memoirs <laughs> <laughs> oh come on john so one is coming uh, no i was just being facetious um no it's a long story i think the the idea of getting a seminal interview like that one took a lot of uh, behind the scenes conversations put it that way mm. because the understanding was that the head of state shouldn't risk the idea of being questioned by a mere mortal such as myself yeah but luckily for the program pretty much like spice fm and your program mm. is that by the time we'd finished with ourselves we had such a standing in society that not to come onto the summit was like chickening out so it was inevitable. Every other presidential candidate had been in additions before. Mm. So it just took his minders to persuade him that he wasn't chicken and he could go through the process too. Right. And he was, uh, if you watch the footage, a, a wonderful interviewee. I did watch the show, actually. Mm, yes, uh, it was very much. good. Uh, everybody was waiting for this this particular one. This is Moy going to be interviewed. Yes. It, it was big. It was big, but I. It was, it was good to interview. He was good to interview because why, it's a sort of. Why in particular was, do you say he was good to interview? Well, the idea, whenever you're CT, when you are in an interview situation, the idea, it's a bit that kind of interview mm. is a bit cat and mouse, because there are different types of interview. This wasn't a profile interview. Mm. This is, you know, how wasn't how wonderful you are, mm. but for example. It was considered at the time, the, the, from, from a broadcaster's perspective, how can you ask a tough question in a kindly way? Mm. So let's go back one. When I talked to Robert Mugabe later on the summit, mm. I began the interview by saying, you're old enough to be my father. And people say that under your leadership, things are worse for Zimbabwe than they were under the white man. Mm. So why don't you bring back the white man? Now, for a man of Mugabe's intelligence, that was, uh, he, he loved it. Yeah. Now, you have to think as a broadcaster, how am I going to put this across? So I remember there were two questions that I thought um, I would put to him. And one was, um, uh, in the bars and restaurants, people are talking about Moi Butu. And in a way, they are comparing you to a dictator. So... Your Excellency, when you go to bed at night, how do you feel when all around you are calling you a dictator? Now, that isn't an accusation. Mm. Uh, and of course, you see in the cat and mouse thing, he immediately came back and said, me, my Mobutu, there's no comparison. Mm. Look at the development. And then you sort of speed up a few days and say, well, you're the father of the nation, but a father often hands over to his children, to his sons and his daughters when your excellency might it come for you to hand over to somebody else so i mean there's a there's a certain <laughs> delight in um, getting the questions across uh, and surviving the experience without being accused of treason mm. in addition to being um, a journalist you also are a thespian you are a teacher you've taught for many years just tell us about that Eric, these are difficult questions. You're still not waiting for my memoirs. You're not patient. No, no, no. Not yet. Uh, the, uh, the, I, I just want a tidbit of, oh, of what yeah, you expect in the memoir. 
the it's very simple. Uh, people go and have an education and end up with a profession. I had an education that had me ending up as a teacher of French in high school. And I taught in high schools as a teacher, Mwalimu, a moniker that is attached to me for over 25 years. Mm. But then, again, historically, I happen to have had a childhood that started off in 1960s London because my father went there to study. And that gave me a sort of heads up in terms of my proximity to and facility with the English language. Mm. So that was the sideshow that always ran against my professionalism. When I was a very little child at school, I presented at an assembly. And in those days, in the 1960s, we had something called the Kenya Schools Broadcasting Division mm -hmm. of the KBC. And the Kenya Schools Broadcasting Division taught people in classrooms long before the internet. They taught people in, in school by radio. Yep. Mm. So uh, the person who came as guest speaker for our speech day picked me up to present a, I presented a poem and he said, oh, this guy would be ideal for the teaching of English on the school's broadcasting. So my broadcasting career historically began when I was about uh, 11 or 12 and this is 55 years later, so yeah. a long time. And your life in the theater, which yes. will lead us now to the conversation about the books that you've written, um, the, the, the plays that you've written, and the conversations that you've wanted to start with your plays. Right. What led you to theater? Well, you know, when you're being very <laughs> diplomatic, the <laughs> first thing that I must do is to thank the people on your show for actually giving a focus to a creative to the arts mm. because i think there is in my own life there is the arts are to me sacred and i would say that giving voice to people like me and others like me uh, poets novelists is just as important as uh, putting on people who are ambassadors talking about bbi because you know, I, I, I would have the, I would have the audacity to say that the creative artist is the is the engine of a society, mm. is the one that's running it. So, thank you for uh, bringing me on the show as a playwright. I started being an actor at school, and I went to a school which placed a great deal of chill on the arts mm. and acting lots of drama competitions and everything and so lots of drama in high school then when the memoirs come out we had the phoenix players run by uh, the late james falkland lots of plays there the phoenix players is the one that sort of spawned uh, lupita nyongo yeah. she started off there as juliet but it's now shut down mm and having acted in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of plays and lots and lots and lots and lots of lead roles the the challenge was given to me to write some myself because we don't have such a canon of plays every kenyan of a certain age would have read ngugi wadiongo mm. uh, uh, the trial of dedan kimadhi uh, and I will marry when I want. Every Kenyan would have heard of the late Francis Mbuga, a personal friend of mine mm. and a big brother type who did betrayal in the city. So generations and generations have been doing betrayal in the city. But if you look, Eric, and do CT, uh, those plays were written in 1975. Mm. So but for the Festag Festival, the Nigerian festival that had the second All Africa so to have a gap where there are no sort of names popping out mm. of this country, let alone of this region, uh, it's been possible through an inspired publisher for somebody to publish all of all six of the plays that I wrote during a period that lasted from 2004 to 2014 mm. and encapsulate them in one volume, which again is something of a first. Normally our playwrights, David Mulwa, Mbuga, all these people are to be read in little 
Aminata, mm -hmm. uh, Redemption. Uh, yeah, so again, it's a bit like the Moy thing. All these things tie up. It's not a big deal that no. I'm doing it, mm. but it's the way to go. And at last it has happened. Mm. So there'll be mine. Next year there'll be somebody else's and such is life. Right. I think that a lot of, a lot of the, in, in, the, in the place that you have written, um, it's in as much as uh, um, they're there for pleasure. I believe that there are messages within um, for Kenyan society, for individuals. What are some of the themes that run through that could point to who Kenyans are and uh, who they ought to be? A good question. And one, I could give a half hour lecture on this one, but I, I, I wish to... I wish to qualify if you're if you're into language and all that kind of thing the precision is key i i don't think that there are messages mm -hmm. but that there are stories mm -hmm. that bear messages mm -hmm. so the first thing that any writer has to do whether it's uh, how the leopard got its spots or how the hyena conquered the elephant uh, sorry, unfortunate example. I'm not thinking straight, but you know, whatever animal got its spots. The, the, the idea is to tell a story and then you ask the little kid uh, at the end of the day, what did this story mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. So let me give you an example and, and you're all great intellect to work it out. The story in the first of my plays had people playing against racial type. So if you were an English person, you would be played by an African. And if you were an Indian person, you would be, might be played by an English person. And mixed as an exam where kids are to told to take on a role so that you can pass your French exams. Mm. So this is a multiracial cast. And central to that is Muse. And Muse was born around about the time of my own father in the 1930s, sort of Mwai Kibaki thing. And he is, it's obviously that he's dying and he's staying as we do with his relation, his wife, mm -hmm. uh, the, his son and his uh, son's wife. But significantly, Ndu, we don't see the husband. He's not there mm. because he's out. Uh, and every single male in the play, when all we, all these families, Asian, European, African, there's the idea of the absentee male. Mm. So is there a message in that? Maybe there is. But Mze, the central character, who is now being played by Mzungu in the, in the thing. So if you've always said, you know, South Asians, Indians are horrible people. The person who's saying that is not a, is an Indian. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yes. you're looking at your own stereotypes. And therefore, again, the movement forward in the days of Ngugi and Imbuga, all their plays were set in fictional African countries. It was in Kafira, mm. Chinua Achebe's in some, mm. some whatever it was. Mm. But now look at the great thing. Not only were we daring to suggest that people might be dictators, but you can actually have Muse remembering about the torture chambers in Nyayo mm. you, and, and asking who killed J.M. Kariuki, who killed Tom Boyer. Now, if I'd attempted to do that in 1975, the stakes would have been dire. Yeah. So the other thing that Kenyans ought to celebrate, there are lots of things that we ought to celebrate as a society, mm. is that maybe nasty things happen and nasty things happen everywhere, but we've made a prodigious leap in allowing the artists to express themselves without fear of detention, without fear of assassination, without fear of living in exile. Mm. And long may it continue. Mm. Here am I chatting to you. So it's important for us to appreciate where we've come from and where we're going as a country. It's also important for us to look at our challenges, that the challenges that we are facing today as a country. Right. It's been said many times that one of the key challenges that we have as a country is this thing called tribalism. Yes. Is it a challenge? For me, uh, as it's very individual, mm. for me, we could... It is the single most pernicious 
and destructive element of our society. How so? I think because tribalism is used to make otherwise intelligent people make silly options. Mm -hmm. So tribalism is used so that if uh, CT were to and contemplate becoming president, I think for me, the thing is, where does he come from? Mm. We're playing our numbers little game yep. <laughs> and we've got to do our little, uh, these uh, intelligent people, when, when we're all sitting together having a drink, we don't sit there for half an hour analyzing our ethnic constructs. But come 2022, there is already a riveting of people's uh, cleavages, uh, so and so doing this. Mm. With the more scary bit is that if you represent enough of a threat, then I'm going to arm you with machetes, cigarettes, uh, petrol, and you're going to cause mayhem and kill people. As we saw in 2007 uh, and 1992, mm. everything that has ripped the Kenyan society apart is owed to ethnicity and tribalism. Mm. Then, as a, as a cousin, mm. as a little cousin of that ethnicity, is that if I'm your man or woman, then I have to have the wherewithal financially to wield the political and social power. Mm. So the small cousin of ethnicity then becomes corruption. But because John, is, it, is it something that folks carry about uh, mm. from your perspective? Is it something that people, Kenyans, because yes. uh, I, I will speak at this point as someone from the outside looking in. Right, but you're, you're, you're Kenyan by choice. What has happened? Yeah. I, I heard the bird. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that it's false. Let's, okay. let's talk about that later. Okay. But it's, now, the thing is, is it something that, that Kenyans carry about um, with them all the time? Or is it something that is whipped out that can be used? The latter, whipped out. Mm. That's why I said it's pernicious. Mm. Because remember my sort of Mickey Mouse definition, it's something that makes intelligent people uh, behave foolishly. Mm. And make uh, irrational decisions. Mm. Uh, tribalism is 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 the fruit where we couldn't envisage how many uh, the smallest group, the El Molo. Mm. Uh, we could never, ever, ever, ever envisage an El Molo president, president of like, this country out of it. Yeah, no matter how, no matter if we we're talking earlier about Hillary Nguyeno, mm. even if he'd gone to Harvard and came back with a nuclear, a degree in nuclear <laughs> physics, he wouldn't crack it. And the mere fact that, um, again, it's not a condemnation. I think we've got to give us, we shouldn't self-flagellate every morning and say, Africa has had a lot to learn in terms of making these leaps and adopting these ways of thought. So uh, did we, did I sort of by association of ideas, did I ever imagine that Mandela would walk free out mm. of Robben Island and greet people? I did not. Uh, did I ever imagine that Barack Obama would take the oath of office as the whatever? I didn't, but it happened. It mm. brought tears to my eyes, but it happened. Mm. And he, he wasn't an ideal president. So there's a movement forward. There's, it's very easy for the artist like myself to be seen as the person who is saying, everything stinks, we've got to go back, This nothing works. Mm. No, you're just saying that good old Shakespearean analogy of holding a mirror up to society and saying, what do you see? Mm. Uh, and maybe sometimes when CT looks at himself in the mirror, he says, oh my gosh, where are my teenage good looks? We've lost them. <laughs> but it's worth uh, him uh, going in and investing in a good sort of skin cream, mm. and 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 the, and and that's the analogy. The the, the 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 artist, the creative, urges you to go and buy the skin cream. So, as a society, sorry, City. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. He's thinking about the skin cream. Okay. Oh, yes. you, you you're stuck on that. <laughs> yes. As a society, then, John, um, we speak and we call ourselves Kenyans, and then during when it comes to politics. We sort of say, okay, Kenyan, but first of all, I am, I am El Molo, I'm Luo, I'm Kikuyu, I'm Kisi, mm. and then I'm Kenyan. Mm. Outside of politics, we are Kenyan. When we are watching our athletes, they're going to Japan, we will be watching them as Kenyans. Their name will not matter. Absolutely. We'll be watching them as Kenyans. When we feel that there's an external threat, 
come together. We all look at that external threat as Kenyans. So where do we draw that line? Who's a Kenyan and who's not a Kenyan? What makes us Kenyan and what makes us Kikuyu? Well, again, one of the things that I'm not is God. So I'm not going to give a sort of a, <laughs> a all embracing uh, definition. But I'll, uh, Eric, I'll tell you what my thoughts are. I think it is the inclination of all of us right from the school playground to make distinctions. I'm sure, and do you remember as a little girl, you probably ganged up with other little girls to sort out the girl who was talking to the boys more. It's the, the idea of, of, of separation, of, of wanting to be distinct, is I think inherent to the sort of animalistic DNA in our nature. Mm. So you're saying, what is it that uh, makes Kenyans come together to sort of cheer on Eliud Kipchoge and then be, you know, burning each other in cathedrals uh, after an election. I think that job has to do with education because there is a great mass grouping of our society that hasn't interacted, that hasn't traveled to each other to see how we live and eat mm. in our various places. Mm. So. The, the ethnic fervor is being whipped up in pockets. You see, if, if you go to my home village and sort of suggested that uh, there's a fellow called C.T. Muga who wants to come in and lead, there's a hostility towards that. Mm. But that's because I've never seen a C.T. Muga in my village. Mm. Uh, we don't so know. We don't know. Yeah. So I think, you know, the teacher in me all those years, I think that education... And I'm sure Mandela's got a quote for that as well. Mm. The be all and end all is making people aware. I'm still returning to this initial image. Mm. If you, you think about it, it doesn't make sense to be tribal. It doesn't make sense. I can't look at and do and of the essence uh, say uh, she's Nigerian by birth and mm. Kenyan by choice. Mm. I have to be, you have to be told. What is the other analogy that, I mean, teachers, you're always with the teacher. So it's always you do with images. Mm. Have you ever thought of this thing? Whenever we go to the village, my relations, uh, my aunties, they never consciously uh, talk about their age. In the conversation, they don't meet and say, oh, my gosh, uh, uh, Celestine, you look young today. <laughs> but then they, they just go off to the shamba and dig. And, they're, and if they're women, they're women. And if they're male, they're male. And they age naturally. But if you have a society where everybody is saying, oh, how old are you? Mm. And then you say, well, I'm such and such. And such. Oh, but do you look so young for your age. Mm. I'd have thought you were 17. Mm. And there are magazines uh, churning out this stuff. Yeah. The awareness of the fact. Uh, long before, under my dictatorship, I would make... I'm oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I'm not I'm giving things away. Uh, uh, <laughs> under my dictatorship, there is something to be said about having a society like the Sings or something where every woman is called Kaur and every man is called Sing. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of the reason is that I'm trying to read something into Muga. I'm trying to read something into Latif. And I haven't really... Uh, read enough into mm. Latif. I'm mm. trying to think, you where the hell does it? Mm. Yeah, how, how, where does this guy come from? Mm. So, but just looking at him, yeah. he could be Ghanaian, he could be Nigerian, he could be anything. Mm. And he could be African American, you know, straight off the streets of New York. So it's the labeling. Mm. And we do, we do a lot to label. So again, under my dictatorship, no ID cards, no asking people, uh, and you can see that in this conversation, I'm trying really, really hard not to make reference to my own origins. Yes. You could play that. You could play that. And then everybody from where I come from would say, rah, yes. rah, 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 rah. Yeah. there's our man. But there's a bit of a mystery to Sibi Okumu, which I've encountered positively and negatively. But I just wish I was called, you know, since we're all Africans, I wish I was called John African mm. and you were Jim African. And you were Nancy African.
And that's all. And that's all. The conversation continues in the Situation Room with Eric Latif, C.T. Muga, Nduoko, and our guest host today, John C. Biokumu, broadcaster, teacher, thespian, playwright, thinker, Kenyan, all those combined. We are talking about being a Kenyan. Who qualifies to be a Kenyan? And as we were going into this break, I actually remembered, you know, one of those Mungano songs, Mungano choir songs. One of them was saying, Mimi Kabila Gani, Kabila Langu Mimi, Kabila La Kenya. They were just saying, whatever, you are Kenyan. It's not about your ethnicity, it's you are Kenyan. And that's what we're asking ourselves. So, who qualifies to be Kenyan? City, you, I'm sure you have 17 questions for John C. Biokum. Start with number one, <coughs> A. I'm not even thinking of the question. I had thought of the question before we went on to the break. Mm. But I'm thinking of what it is that influences or educates my mind when it re when with relation to how I identify myself. W what are the contributors to this self-identification? Mm. Is it uh, my heritage, as in beginning with my parents? Is it my education? Is it my socialization? Uh, I mean, what is it? And as I was thinking about it, the country of Tanzania came to mind. Because in Tanzania, people call themselves Tanzanians. <laughs> it's, it's how they think. Whereas in Kenya, if you ask me uh, who I am, I will tell you I'm Kenyan, yes. But my thinking is when you ask me who I am, I don't think of Kenya first. Mm. I think of it as an acceptable response. But I think of myself in terms of my ethnicity, where I come from. And part of the reason is because as you grow up in this country, one of the things that is required of you, and it's even in our identi identification cards or identification uh, documents, where you come from is of great importance. It's very, very important. So my mind is informed about my self of identification beginning with my ethnicity. Mm -hmm. But I personally do not think that that in and of itself is negative. Personally, mm. it, it isn't negative. It's like talking about colors and saying that you'd like the acceptable color to be green and then every other color is questionable. No, no, no. The, 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 the whole idea of color is important because of the diversity that it presents. But what is it that makes this simple process of identification negative? If you look at the country of Tanzania that came to my mind and I look at the concept of Ujama, which was introduced by the, the, the founding president, uh, Julius Nyerere, and, 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 he, and the people around him, because it isn't, we talk of one person, but it's always a group of people thinking about it. Mm. And you realize that because of the way they structured their society, or the way they brought about the structure of the society, it wasn't there before they brought it. People identified themselves as members of communities, which, as I said, is not negative. Even now, with the years that have gone by, and as, uh, as, as was pointed out by you, Eric, and, and, and you, John, Tanzania has more ethnic communities than we have in Kenya, but you never hear of them. But when we talk about Kenya, the thing that we talk about most is our ethnicity. So what is it that has brought to the point where ethnicity is the focal point of our discussions when you talk about being Kenyan? You're Kenyan, yes. But your ethnicity is actually at the heart. Even when you don't talk about it, it's behind every conversation you have when you talk about being Kenyan. Like this one, Kenyan of Asian origin. Yes. Well, CT, there, there are several things that are worth commenting upon. One of them is that the question of age, in the sense that if you look at my children as the product of an inter-ethnic union. There are several things that they're not doing that playing the game. And that is, apart from speaking Kiswahili, which they learnt at school, patchily, and English well, they do not speak my mother tongue, neither do they speak their mother's. I'm trying to say by this little anecdote is that... So they don't have a mother tongue? No, uh, in as much as no, because no. Uh, we don't speak it at home. But they're not... There's another group of youngsters out there who are mm. not growing with, up with all this baggage. 
they're not come saying i come from so and so east mm. so aren't they the kenyans we want aren't they the africans we want uh, they will they will have a name they'll going uh, for christmas i'm sure ct you take your kids christmas easter you take them somewhere but i i don't think that they share your rabid uh, sort of attachment to your to your ethnic group the other thing that you must do where it's negative is that we must be aware of this idea that there is uh, unity and diversity it's a nice slogan it's a very nice slogan to have but we also have to think about the idea of opportunity if you get into a situation where there is diversity but there are we're in this room and three of us have can have a conversation which totally excludes and do mm. we greet each other every day there's a whole thing going on uh, which is which is ex we want to include either we're going to adopt this idea of the nation state and go for it and don't forget that the global village is also obviating the nation state mm. so are we going back to the way where, where i would sort of say i am so and so I am the great grandchild of so and so. Praise myself. I come from such and such and such a clan. You are not of the same clan, do so. There could be a thing between us. Mm -hmm. That kind of classification has gone because I could well, as has been seen in creative works, I could meet my niece at a disco and mm -hmm. start propositioning her. The it's world has know. changed. Mm -hmm. the, the, the world has changed. But the idea of equal opportunity in a society. When opportunity is pegged to ethnicity, then surely ethnicity must be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody is telling you to stop being what you are. But if it's at the expense of me also progressing when I have like attributes, like qualifications, and perhaps better, then it's something against which a society must legislate. But then In order to have change, you've got to do things like call everybody a Tanzanian mm -hmm. or... Uh, outlaw speaking uh, ethnic tongues in the office place it's not colonial it's not anything it's either we're going to be united or we're going to be divided so in order to stop the kind of conflict that we see that comes out as a result of some of these then the best thing to do or i'm asking is it the best thing to do to legislate so that you're not suggesting but that you're kind of forcing people to behave in a certain manner and then adopt a certain attitude I think yes <laughs> again there's history we don't there's history this is not going to be sort of if you were both francophone if you learnt about the great napoleon yeah. what did he do uh, the great tribe go back to the roman empire when they were sort of going from one end you know outer mongolia all the way to the uk mm -hmm. this centralized thing uh, latin you know whatever you were that's what you did yeah and in order to be to talk to the consul you had to sort of like you know come out with a few latin phrases napoleon took the breton and the whatever and the longer dock and all these tribes and standardized mm. the french language to be what it is today even the queen's english if you go back to the knocking together of heads okay they're welshmen they're scotsmen and even now we hear they, uh, they, they please bring in the irish mm -hmm. and the irish thank you they, they want to someone wish to secede but for the greater glory of great britain the heads have been knocked together to adopt One. the english language mm. so the idea of legislation the idea of the idea i think as kenyans we mm. would do well as a society to legislate more things we could do a league one you and say you know don't litter the streets mm -hmm. we could say don't drop chewing gum nairobi will be a cleaner place it, as long as there are lots of people good people mm. we're not on a desert island mm. it's not robinson crusoe there are 47 million of us 47 million people cannot all be walking about doing whatever they wish to do as individuals mm. there are certain things which kiddie terms are good which it must be bad to do yes it's but, bad we're not going to do that yeah. As, as I hear you, John, and I, I get what you're saying, you know, in terms of what our ethnicity is doing to the national fabric and psyche of saying we are Kenyan and then saying, let's promote this one thing and say we are all Kenyan and sort of try and uh, minimize the importance of our tribes. That could be counterproductive, though. In what way? In terms of developing 
our societies and our histories and our cultures and our, our roots. As somebody who loves language, yes, you've been teaching a foreign language, yes, you're speaking a foreign language, yes, um, but then you're saying that, you know what, my children will not know my local language, my mother's language, right. aren't we killing our own languages in it's, favor of this, then this big one foreign language? A very and, and before you answer that, yes. the, there was so also this two questions in one. I was yes. just going to go back on that one. <laughs> I'm ready for that one. I, I'm, I'm basically just building up on this. Mm -hmm. There was previously there was another push again to say children when they go to ECD, they should all be taught only in English or Swahili. Previously, ECD you teach you start by learning in your mother tongue. If you're somewhere, let's say in 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 Tana River and the local people there speak Pokomo, you go to, you started speaking your mother tongue, Pokomo. So you go to school and you're taught in Pokomo and then you're taught to now bring in Pokomo into English. Then there was a push now to say, let's not do that because we're promoting tribalism and ethnicity. Is that not counterproductive? It's not counterproductive. You must, if you're going to see something through the Pokomo, in the Kenya that we have today, let us assume that there is a region of Kenya in which children are being taught in Taita. And you, Eric, go to work there, and you're not Taita. So surely, for your children, Taita is not a mother tongue. Yeah. So you can't, what's the word, uh, what's the word they use? You can't spread that notion and, and make it stick. What I'm saying is that you must be aware. It's very, very seductive when you tell people that everything that exists has to be sustained. But if you listen to all the sort of Richard Attenborough's, uh, D David Attenborough's, mm. and Richard Leakey's, all these people, mm. they will tell you that the, 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 the story of our existence is about extinction and change. And change. Yeah. And, you know, we're not sort of saying, oh, my gosh, what's happened to Prectorodilus? What's happened to Brontosaurus? Mm -hmm. They were really nice dinosaurs. <laughs> they, have, they have disappeared. So the end justifies the means. What I would say is that if, as a parent or as parents, we can create an environment in which our offspring can retain these facets of our culture mm. they will be sustained within mm. so for example if i'm in it's getting rarer and rarer but people i i relish the idea of meeting people who speak my quote unquote mother tongue so when we meet but then if they come into my household and we start gassing away it's the to the exclusion of my wife mm. and ditto when her relations come and they adopt their language i feel excluded but is this idea that just to be able to have a set of sounds, languages are a set of sounds mm. that make sense to people at a certain time. Uh, does the, does the African-American really wanting to go back and talk to the Yoruba that took him off from across the Atlantic? Does the Polish American, does the Italian American, does the Jewish American really, really lament the death of Yiddish in American society? No. They will say, I'm a Polish Jew, yeah. I'm a Polish Jew, I'm an American Jew, but I think they speak to each other in American English. Mm. That's true, but I think they romanticize the idea of going back home. Well, <laughs> you've seen yeah. incidences where somebody who is a black American lands in Africa and kisses the ground and says, you know what, these are my mm. roots. There's yeah, a thing the, about, no. about identity and your roots and where right. you come from. Right, that, no, sorry. The... When you decide that uh, a polity, a, a set of boundaries, is we are here, partly being Kenyan means that we fall under Kenyan jurisdiction. Certain things happen in this country that don't happen elsewhere. Mm. Maybe part of being Kenyan is to know that I can travel always with a 200 bob note on the dashboard and know that if a cop pulls me aside for any infringement, the exchange of the 200 bob and I'm off. That's also part of being Kenyan, yep. because I might try to do that in uh, New York City mm. or Singapore, uh, or I might try to give an inducement to the elevator man, and it won't go down. 
So why doesn't it go down in these other societies? Because it's stepped on. And you, when you escalate that whole notion, mm -hmm. it goes to the notion of people making offenses as a society and go, getting away scot-free. The whole notion of impunity. You can do what you like. So as long as we stay that way, mm. and I think uh, Museveni has given us a little viral clip that way, <laughs> we will be forever the God-forsaken primitives and other people will impose on us. So in other words, the consequences of our conduct, mm. uh, actions have consequences. We, we dream of the African Renaissance. We dream of the Africa we want. Mm. We dream of Pan-Africanism. If we dream of Pan-Africanism, then let's go for Swahili, Hausa, Arab, Wolof, and say every kid in Nairobi ought to be learning Wolof. Other things will go by the wayside. But the sentiment is being attached to what is by its very nature is never going to survive. But you know, John, the thing that underpins all these things, the thread that ties them together, mm. is benefit. You see, my being ethnic, if it presents no benefit whatsoever to me, I do not need someone to tell me to abandon it. I will quietly abandon it. Anything that we look at... Any grouping, even if you leave tribal, uh, tribalism uh, aside, any grouping that human beings tend to move to or gravitate towards, there has to be benefit. But you're arguing my corner, CT. Are you aware that you're arguing my corner? I you're am. saying <laughs> that who benefits if it benefits a certain grouping, yes. but we want to stop those who feel that it is entitlement to benefit. You see... My argument. To feel entitled, mm. I am therefore, I, we, that is the idea of dynasties and the whole sort of hustler versus whatever mm. dialogue that we're living it's, through it's, now. It's cronyism, really. I mean, there are many names, uh, many facets of the same discussion that bear certain titles, certain names, certain labelings when explaining the same thing. But it doesn't detract from the basic understanding. You see, talk numbers, talk identity, talk benefit. All you're saying is, at the end of the day, we will not gravitate towards something that does not offer any benefit to us. And I'm saying that even as you talk about change, and I'm agreeing with you, you talk about change. If the change appears to be beneficial, yes, then I will gravitate towards it. If it doesn't, then I won't. Now, the reason so why you're saying that Kenyans shouldn't see the benefit in gravitating towards an abandonment no, no. of ethnicity? No, no, no. They won't get it? No, no, no. no. That's why I'm saying you're... No. I agree with you. I'll give no. my corner. No. We should get rid of the benefits as a nation so that people perceive that there's expanded benefit for all. We're not getting rid of the notion of benefit, CT. We're just spreading the Are you jam. aware that you're hijacking my argument <laughs> and, 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 you're, and you're propelling it in... And pulling it to your in, corner. In a direction that corner. suits you. Yeah, yeah and, well, that's, and, that's and, what and, I and, thought I came here to do. Yeah, precisely. Mm. And, and I haven't actually even completed what I wanted to say. But the thing that you've done well is hijack what I'm saying. And you've presented your case well. But let me add a little bit to what you're saying. You see... Nothing that we do as mankind, in my view, is done without this small notion. And benefit isn't benefit until it is balanced by the absence of it or something negative. Now, if you look at what we call Western-style progress, as in creating a middle class, uh, having ourselves surrounded by all manner of consumer-isms, uh, co consumer things and what have you. The whole notion of modernization seems to revolve around some of these ideas and the manifestations of it. Now, modernization in and of itself really not just chips at, but it erodes the very notion of tribalism to a very, very large extent. One, through your education, through your associations, etc., etc., but why did I focus on benefit? Because it is the one thing when it is slanted in a certain direction for historical reasons or otherwise, it is the one thing that promotes tribalism more than anything else. Mm. Because one, people feel it offers you security, even if it doesn't. 
People feel it offers you opportunities for economic advancement. People feel it offers you the very thing that would make your life better, even if it doesn't. So the notion for this to be disabused and for it to get to a point where you see it naked, I was about to say butt naked, for what it actually is, then the understanding, as you say correctly, of this idea of being Kenyan, meaning it has to resonate, but the only way it resonates is if you can see the benefit of not being tribal. And yet, we brought about the notion of counties with this in mind, cascading benefits to the very grassroots. Mm. And yet, by so doing, we've actually gone and encouraged this very notion of tribalism again. Not in its negative sense, because when you talk about counties, counties, we have, the very concept is within the boundaries and within communities of ethnicity it's communities that's you know communities come from ethnicity <coughs> I, I i am yet to be convinced by what you're saying john that you know we need to start downgrading our ethnicity and we need to start you know, promoting one universal homogenous ethnic grouping and say this is who we are we i i i don't get it but i think you will continue with the conversation um, let's hear even from our listeners as well as our audience 0719 or Spice FM KE YouTube, Facebook and Twitter what defines a Kenyan who qualifies to be a Kenyan what is it that makes us Kenyan and who we are this is the Situation Room the only way to start your day